Hi, hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our Zoom meeting CCMA webinar on thyroid ablation. And I'm Dana from Microwave. Um, in case some of you don't know about CCMA, so it is short for China Conference on Microwave Ablation, and it is a first class international platform for academic exchange and multi party cooperation in tumor ablation field. And as the biggest microwave ablation manufacturer in China, Echo Microwave is the main sponsor of this event. And before we get started, I'm inviting you to subscribe to the Echo Microwave official LinkedIn account for future webinar information. And uh, please don't forget to send your questions to the Zoom chat box. They will be discussed at the end of the session. And if you need participation certificate emails, email us to the uh, info email address as usual. And meanwhile, the whole session will be recorded for future education purposes. So now, allow me to introduce uh, today's uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, our moderator, Dr. Roberto Walcavi, is an interventional endocrinologist from the Endocrine and Thyroid Clinic of Reggio Emilia, Italy. But unfortunately, Dr. Walcavi could not join us today due to the sudden occurred health condition. We sincerely hope that he will recover soon and join us for the next event. And speaker Dr. Giovanni Mori is an interventional radiologist and assistant professor of radiology from the Institute of European Oncology. Hi, hi, Dr. Mori. Hi, and, and thank you very much for having invited me to very, this very interesting uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, thank you. And uh, the second speaker, Dr. Bulan Cekic, is an interventional radiologist and associate professor at Interventional Radiology Department of Antalya Training and Research Hospital, Turkey. Hi, Dr. Cekic. Hi, thank you for your invite. Hello for everything. Uh, thank you for joining us. And the, the last speaker is Dr. Jose Luis Takura, is the president of Spanish Society of Ultrasound, HOD of Radiology Department at Donostia University Hospital, Spain. And Dr. Takura, um, he pre recorded his speech for us, so he will join the meeting at the QA session. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into the main topic today. So the first topic is from Dr. Giovanni Mori. The topic is thermoablation in benign and malignant thyroid nodules. And now we have the guidelines. Uh, I'm gonna share Dr. Mori's recording. Okay. Dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the beginning for having me for this very interesting. Uh, for benign thyroid nodules. I will talk to you initially on benign condition and then on the malignant one. If you see from this table, still a very large number of patients every year undergo surgery for thyroid uh, diseases and a different rate going from 30% in Italy to close to 60% in France are treated for benign conditions. 
So the numbers where we can start to have an impact are very, very large, because uh, if not if not all, as for sure, a majority of those cases can be managed in a more conservative way than surgery. Better understand the aspect of minimally invasive uh, techniques in uh, thyroid nodular disease. In 2019, the European Thyroid Association had a survey among their uh, participants. So a survey was sent to all the members through Europe to understand uh, how they approach uh, uh, minimally invasive treatments of the thyroid. And in this survey, uh, some different scenarios were presented. For example, it was asked, it was presented as a case of a 50 years old female with a four centimeter spongiform nodule, eutarets two with a benign final aspiration with symptoms of compression. And following an identical case, but in a patient of 75 year old with severe comorbidities like diabetes, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and renal failure. How did the participant uh, answer? In the first case, 60% requested uh, surgery, and only 70% suggested uh, radiofrequency and 8% laser means a thermal ablation. While the scenario completely changed in the case of older patients, for example, for the case of the 75 years old male, where uh, the majority, but still only one third of the participants recommended the thermal, uh, thermal ablation. So there is some idea that this kind of procedure can be offered, but still particularly in very complex uh, patients when surgery is not, is not feasible. Also, again, other two uh, scenarios of a patient with malignant thyroid disease, again, 75 year old female or 25 years old female uh, with thyroidectomy and lateral and central compartment neck dissection, and afterward, local non radioiodine iodine lymph node metastasis. You see, in the old case of the 75 years old female, uh, still. Uh, 55% uh, of participants requested surgery as first treatment option, while in the case of the young one, surgery uh, was requested in the lower uh, number of patients, and ablation uh, had a higher percentage of, of responders. So again, quite a variable, a variable uh, scenarios. But particularly, uh, one point that came to the attention was that in close to 70% of cases, the responders never or rarely refer patient to center with specific expertise in thermal ablation. But if they do not have uh, in their hospital this kind of expertise, they do not suggest thermal ablation. And this is quite strange from one side, but uh, uh, determined us to try to understand a little bit better why uh, so many endocrinologists uh, did not consider thermal ablation. And the reason why physician never or rarely refer patient to ultrasound guided procedure, minimally invasive uh, treatments, was in the majority of cases because there were no endocrine society guideline on the use of minimally invasive treatments. So in some way, uh, endocrinologists were scared about uh, referring a patient to a procedure that was not included into a guideline. That's why uh, in the 2020, the European Thyroid Association published the first clinical practice guideline to use of thermal ablation in benign thyroid nodules. And also, 
uh, this year, we, together also with the Cardiovascular Interventional Society of Europe, uh, performed an analysis and published the clinical practice guideline for the use of minimally invasive treatments in malignant thyroid lesions. So at the present, we have two guidelines, one for benign and one for malignant. So this should be the basis for enlarging the application of minimally invasive treatments uh, in uh, patients with thyroid nodules. However, we should acknowledge that guidelines are not enough and sometimes uh, might not be only an angel, but may determine the relevant problems for physicians that can feel compelled to decide for some uh, procedure instead of others. So uh, the main purposes of clinical guidelines are to describe the appropriate care based on the best available scientific evidence and uh, a broad consensus, trying to reduce the inappropriate variation in the clinical practice for a more rational basis for referral, focus of, for continued education to promote an efficient use of the resources, which are also uh, always limited, to act as a focus for quality control, including audit, and to highlight shortcomings of existing literature and suggest appropriate future research. However, from it is known that from the publication of guidelines, there's always uh, some barriers to their implementation in the clinical activity because there are general resistances to changes. It, they are seen sometimes as a loss of professional autonomy, and uh, uh, sometimes there's also an inadequate skill set and lack of decision to support technology. Often they are out of date because when they are published are based on old literature and uh, the current practice is changing while the guidelines are published. Also, we should always remember that the value judgment made by a guideline development group might be the wrong choice for individual patients. So again, always remember that guidelines provide us with a guide, but not with a strict indication on what really we should do. It's something that we have to take into consideration. So let's start from the guidelines on benign thyroid nodules published in 2020 by this group of authors. As a background, we should just briefly remember that there are uh, papers like this meta-analysis that I coordinated and we published in 2020, showing how uh, thermal ablation are able to provide uh, long-lasting results, both radiofrequency and laser, with sustained results over at least three years. So we have a robust meta-analysis uh, that provide us good results. And also another paper of the Italian multidisciplinary group for the study of minimally invasive treatments uh, published by my colleague, Dr. Bernardi, which I had the pleasure to coordinate and showing how the results are uh, sustained at five years with very good results, but highlighting how in some cases there might be a regrowth of the nodule. So this is something that we should always take into consideration when uh, thinking about proposing this kind of treatment to our patient, because we have to take care of the idea that one third of cases sometimes might recur, might have a regrowth of the, of the nodule. A systematic literature review was performed, and in both guidelines, a grading of quality of evidence was performed, going from very low to low, to moderate or high, and a level of recommendation was divided into two levels, strong or weak. So in all the recommendation, you will see a grade of evidence and a level of recommendation. The first recommendation state that in older patients with benign thyroid nodules that cause pressure symptoms, remember, we have to treat symptomatic nodules or cosmetic concerns and decline surgery, image guided thermal ablation or minimal invasive treatment should be considered as a cost and effective 
alternative option to surgical treatment or observation. So still in this guideline, it is suggested that the patient should be not candidate to surgery or decline surgery. I would just like to point out that in our national guidelines, we uh, instead stated that thermal ablation may be proposed as a first line treatment for solid non-functioning current nodules. So actually we are moving a little bit from the option to apply this treatment only in patient not suitable for surgery to uh, a real alternative to surgery offering this treatment as a first line treatment. I'm not going to read you all the recommendations that you can easily find in the paper, but I just would like to show you the one that I think are most interesting also for potential later debate. So the third recommendation, remember that before ablation of a thyroid lesion, a benign psychological diagnosis is needed. It is suggested to repeat an FNA for cytological benign nodules uh, with the exception of spongiform nodules and purely cystic nodules. So nodules with uh, very clear ultrasound features of benignity. Also, it, there's a strong recommendation against performing minimally invasive treatment for those nodules that present with yeah. high risk ultrasound features. So if you are a suspect in ultrasound, in FNA, do not perform thermal ablation. The sixth recommendation state that local subcutaneous and pericapsular anesthesia is recommended. It is possible also not to perform local anesthesia, for example, when performing laser, but still it is uh, recommended. Conscious sedation can be used, it can be considered, so it is the choice of the operator. It's not uh, obligatory to do mild conscious sedation, but can be, can be used. The eight uh, is about uh, the suggestion for uh, the uh, evaluation after treatment. So an early term in two to three months, mid term six and 12 months, and then every one to two years ultrasound evaluation is recommended. At 12 recommendation, state that in multinodular goiter, due to the present lack of evidence of efficacy and particularly for the need of repeated treatment that can occur in a not negligible number of cases, thermal ablation should be restricted to those patients with a very well-defined dominant nodal in the setting of the multinodular goiter, or those who are not candidate for thyroid surgery or radioactive treatment as a palliative therapy option. So at the moment, multinodular goiter is still not uh, our ideal field of application. Another recommendation, 13 recommendation, state that because of a higher cost and complexity as compared with aspiration and ethanol ablation, at the present thermal ablation are not recommended as first-line treatment for pure or predominantly cystic thyroid lesions. Again, strong recommendation. It means that in the presence of cystic lesion, still ethanol ablation is the first option of treatment because it is cheaper and easier to be performed. Also, uh, thermal ablation should be considered in a young patient with small autonomously functioning thyroid nodule and particularly in those cases with small nodules and incomplete suppression of the perinodular thyroid tissue due to the higher probability of normalization of the thyroid function and the advantage of avoiding irradiation and restricting the risk of late hypothyroidism. These were the recommendations for benign nodule. Let's see a clinical case of a patient with a malignant one. This is a female. Uh, uh, nodule. Here you can see the images where once detected, we decide to perform FNA. There should be debated if it with such a small nodule, FNA sh should have been performed, but we found a small papillary thyroid cancer. And so once we have detected 
a small papillary thyroid cancer, we really would want to propose our patient not to do nothing, or we want to move the patient directly to surgery, or why not to propose image-guided ablation? Once we have overdiagnosed a very small uh, nodule, we have seen this with ultrasound, performed FNA, found a cancer, why we cannot try to minimize the invasiveness of tree. That's what we do. And in our patient, we propose at our institution always the three options. We recently published our preliminary results with quite a small series of patients. But what I would like to point out is that all the patients that were feasible, in which ablation was feasible, agreed and were very happy of having this option. Bon, Coming to the guideline, bon. stated as the first recommendation that it is necessary to take into consideration the use of minimally invasive treatments in the multimodal approach to patients with thyroid cancer. So when you deal with a patient with thyroid cancer, a multidisciplinary discussion should take place and image guided ablation should be among the panel of available options. How to balance between uh, uh, minimal invasive treatments or surgery in the paper are also reported some factors favoring surgery or favoring thermal ablation. For example, the age, the familiar history of aggressive form of thyroid cancer, then the refusal of surgery, and also the presence of expertise of both thyroid surgery and uh, uh, ultrasound guided procedures. Then a multidisciplinary team, including members with specific expertise in minimally invasive treatments, should perform the selection of patients eligible for minimally invasive treatment based on the patient's clinical, demographic, and imaging characteristics. Regarding the modality to be chosen for minimally invasive treatment, this should be selected on the basis of the staging of disease, patient characteristics and preferences, and also specific competencies and resources at the treating care centers. So there is not a, a clear rule uh, for using microwaves, for using radio frequency or laser, but it really depends on the case by case, on patient characteristics, but also by the experience of the operator and the availability of the material. It means that if you are very good in microwave ablation, go with microwave ablation for thyroid nodule. But also, it is strongly recommended always to inform the patient about the feasibility of minimally invasive treatment, its advantages and limitations in comparison with other strategies. This means that when you face this kind of patient, you cannot anymore do not tell them anything about this option. Patients should be informed about the presence of minimally invasive treatments. That can be also considered for palliative purposes, but only for palliative purposes in a tech context of a multidisciplinary approach in patients with other kind of primary thyroid cancer other than low risk PTNC. And here the strength of recommendation is lower. This is really only for palliative purposes. What about uh, recurrences? We know that recurrences might occur in a not negligible number of cases and might be highly disabling for, for patients where second surgery might be extremely challenging for the possible side effects and should be always carefully weighted against the risk of treatment failure. Also, most recurrences are not clearly aggressive and patient is worried and sometimes prefer, but patient prefer clearance of the disease. So again, might we have any kind of role in lowering the invasiveness of treatment by providing an effective cure for patients? 
And here we say that to consider minimally invasive treatment as an alternative option to surgical neck dissection in patients with radio refractory cervical recurrences who are at surgical risk or decline further surgery. So again, in these cases, this uh, is an option that should be taken into consideration, but only in cases not suitable or refusing surgery and that cannot be managed by radioiodine ablation. Here also, there are some factors that can be in favor of thermal ablation and other that can favor surgery. If you have an old patient with relevant comorbidities, previous neck dissection, uh, with a feasible ablation, so with a limited number of metastases and ideally small metastases, so and you have an easy percutaneous access, so ablation can be the ideal option for this patient. In the other option, if you have a very young a uh, patient with no comorbidities, acceptance of surgeries, multiple metastases, or larger one, and with a good long-term prognosis, so still surgery might be the ideal option for these, uh, for these patients. Just let me conclude showing you a case of a patient with a lymph node, a metastatic lymph node from uh, papillary thyroid cancer, you see a single uh, lesion, quite small, uh, quite easy to be reached in a percutaneous way. The patient was uh, already treated with two neck dissection, so she really refused to have another surgery. We perform percutaneous uh, ablation. You see the gas forming during the treatment. We always perform CUS after the treatment to evaluate the presence of uptake or the complete devascularization of the lesion. And here you can see the result where we have the pre-ablation PET CT scan and 12 months after the complete absence of uptake at that level. So a complete treatment with very, very minimally invasiveness. So coming to conclusion, we can state that in older patients with benign thyroid nodule, that cause pressure symptoms. Always remember that we are treating the symptoms of the patient, not the nodule. In these cases, thermal ablation should be considered as an alternative option to surgery. And now we have guidelines that state us that we should consider this. We are no more allowed not to tell the patient that this option exists. Even if this is not available in our hospital, we have to tell this to the patient and eventually to refer the patient to another center. Also, these procedures can be suggested in patients with autonomous functional nodule, particularly if they are small when the results are really better, and an incomplete suppression of the perinodular tissue uh, is present because in these cases, there is a higher probability of thyroid function normalization and the absence of late hypothyroidism that can be conversely deriving from uh, a radioiodine ablation. The choice of surgery or thermal ablation should be the result of a careful balance between the nodal characteristics, general clinical conditions, available resources, and the patient's value and preferences. Regarding malignant diseases, consider the using of thermal ablation for patients with low risk papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, particularly if the patient is at surgical risk, is expected to have a short life expenses, or is unwilling to undergo surgery or active surveillance. Often patients do not really like active surveillance once we have diagnosed a cancer, but on the other hand, are scared about major surgery. Also, thermal ablation can be considered as an alternative to surgical neck dissection in those patients with radioiodine refractory recurrences again in cases at high surgical risk or in patient who decline further surgery. So we have nowadays two guidelines 
one for benign, one for malignant conditions that can guide our practice toward a larger application of thermal ablation in the patient with thyroid diseases. And so thanks to those two papers, I think and I hope that the number of procedures that we will be able to perform will increase significantly in the next years. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, hoping to having provided you a clear enough overview of the present uh, guidelines. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Um... That was that was an excellent lecture from Dr. J uh, Dr. Mori, and we will back uh, we'll come back to Dr. Mori at the Q and A session. So our next speaker is Dr. Bulan Cekic from Turkey, and his topic will be differences in microwave ablation and radiofrequency ablation application in thyroid ablation. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me, let me, okay, now you can share your slide. Okay. Okay, hello, I'm Bülent Çekic from Antalya, Turkey. Uh, I present today difference in microwave ablation and uh, radio frequency ablation application and thyroid ablation. Now, uh, as you know, thyroid thermal ablation, uh, the goal of each is to elevate tissue temperatures enough to create zones of irreversible uh, cellular damage. Thermal ablation heats tissue to cytotoxic level through which cell death is caused. Afterwards, the created coagulant necros is degraded by the patient's own immune system. The temperatures between 60 and 100 Celsius Nearly immediate tissue coagulation is induced with irreversible damage caused to the tumor tissue, while temperatures greater than 100 and 110 Celsius result in tissue evaporation and carbonization. Here is a diagram, uh, and there are the temperature range and what oh, they. Uh, I'm sorry yes? to interrupt. Uh, we can't see the slide moving. Sorry. It's all right. And now, can you see? We, we can see the slide, but it's only the first page. Okay. What can I, one minute. Can you uh, see now? Yeah, now we can see it, yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, and uh, here are the temperature range and what uh, caused the pyologic effect. And as we see, uh, the ideal, uh, uh, temperature range is between 80 and 100. In this uh, range, the biological effect is permeabilization of the cell membranes. But if the uh, temperature range is between 100 and 150, vaporization and carbonization occur, and we don't want this. In thermal ablation, in radio frequency or in microwave, in 80, between 80 and 100 uh, Celsius, uh, occur cytotoxic effect and then cell death, coagulates necrosis and destroyed by immune system microbes. But above 100 Celsius, the carbonization in the tissue uh, occur and then uh, the phagostate can phagostate by macrophage. Radio frequency ablation, uh, a high frequency electric current between 200 and 1200 kilohertz flows through ionic canals and causes fractional heat at the ion level, followed by a local temperature increase. The most efficient heating is produced by the high current within the several millimeters of the electrode tip and result in tissinicrous. The heating effect of radio frequency ablation that causes thermal tissue necros is a combination of frictional and conductive heat. Uh, the frictional heat is the immediate tissue coagulation necrosis is achieved by the frictional heat generated in the vicinity of the electrode. The conductive heat is electrode remote nodule 
uh, ablated more slowly via conductive heat. And a radio frequency ablation unit consists of a 18 uh, gauge antenna and a seven and 10 millimeter active tip. The generator is capable of producing between one and 100 watt, but entire uh, RFA be mostly use uh, 50 watt. To prevent shaft overheating, this water is circulated through dual channels inside the antenna shaft, continuously cooling the shaft. Uh, and it works according to the tissue impedance. It goes up to maximum of 800 ohms. Uh, and above 800 ohm, uh, it causes tissue carbonization. In RF uh, radio frequency ablation, uh, the generators stop automatically above 800 ohm, and that prevents from the carbonization. In microwave, Ablation, uh, microwave ablation uses the heat generated from the rotation of the molecular dipoles following the alternate electric field component of the ultra high speed uh, between 2450 megahertz microwave. The microwaves pass through the tissue around the exposed antenna of the electrode, causing the water molecules in the tissue to vibrate and rotate. Then heat is generated and results in thermal coagulation of the target tissue. And this is a microwave ablation node. Uh, it consists of the uh, microwave generator flexible low loss coaxial uh, cable internally cooled. Uh, it has a 17 gauge, 10 centimeter shaft, 3.5 millimeter activity. The shaft is coated with polytetrafluoroethylene to prevent tissue addition. And the generator is positioned between one and 100 watt of power at 2450 megahertz. But uh, in the clinic practice, in thyroid ablation, we use low powers between 20 and 30 to avoid carbonization. Here are uh, the underlying mechanism of action and heat transfer uh, for microwave and radio frequency ablation. This is microwave ablation. In microwave ablation is the main heating, direct heating. But in radio frequency ablation, uh, the thermal conduct dense is more. And here's a diagram about the uh, temperature uh, between uh, radio frequency and microwave. In radio frequency uh, ablation, the temperature is stable uh, between 100 Celsius. But in microwave ablation, the temperature goes fastly to 150, 175, and therefore we use uh, low uh, watts, and this is 20 and 30 watts. Here are some parameters that affect the ablation volumes using microwave ablation and try to frequency ablation technologies. Uh, the tissue properties, uh, radio frequency uh, ablation is more sensitive. In perfusion and heat sink effect in radio frequency ablation is more sensitive. The ablation assessment is both same. The imaging accuracy is, I think, is both same. The tissue contraction is in microwave ablation a bit, little bit more. What is the advantage of radio frequency ablation compared to microwave ablation? The antenna used for radio frequency ablation is thinner than microwave antenna, it is 18 gauge. Uh, it works according to the tissue impedance. It goes up to a maximum of 800 ohms. And as you know, uh, about 800 ohm is uh, causes tissue carbonation. And uh, therefore, uh, it's protective negative effect on carbonization. And radio frequency ablation uh, have more experience. What is the advantage of microwave uh, ablation compared to radio uh, We have higher temperatures in the ablation zone. We can make larger ablated tissue volumes in the same time. Optimal heating in cystic nodules and in hypervascular nodules in toxic adenomas. Less pain during the procedure. The tissue impedance doesn't matter, but we have no inhibitor effect on preventing carbonization. Uh, in microwave ablation. And we can use microwave ablation in uh, pregnancy or in patients that have heart disease because 
In microablation, we don't require placement of grounding plates. Here are some uh, research papers. The first research paper is from Dr. Uh, Cho from Korea. And in this research paper, they searched studies uh, reporting patients with benign thyroid nodules treated with thermal ablation and with follow-up data of more than three years. And they uh, analyzed yielded serial volume reduction rates of ablated nodules for up to three years or more and adverse effect of ablation during follow-up. And in this uh, meta-analysis, only uh, the research from Dr. Jung is a prospective uh, research. The another research are uh, retrospective. And if we look to the characteristic of the ablation methods by radiofrequency ablation, the mean power is uh, 45, 55, and 78. And uh, mostly, the operators use multiple seasons. Only in the research paper from Dr. D'Andrea, he used only one single station to ablate uh, the thyroid nodules. And if we look to the ablation results, uh, the lowest uh, volume reduction rate is uh, by the research paper from Dr. Aldea Martinez, but the volume range is the highest in this research. In the another uh, research paper from Dr. Jung, Lim, and Sim, they have similar volume reduction rate results, but uh, the uh, volumes of the thyroid nodules is the same, 10, uh, 14, or 14. And that means that uh, the volume uh, affect the volume reduction rate. Here's another paper from uh, Dr. Lu. And in this research paper, they uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the microwave ablation to the treatment of thyroid nodules according to the nodule composition. And they uh, study evaluated 175 patients with 180 benign thyroid nodules. And when we look, uh, the nodule uh, composition uh, are here three solid, predominant solid, and predominant kistic. And in uh, the best results is on the predominant kistic. And if we look in the same research paper to the nodule uh, volume, uh, the best uh, in this is a, uh, no, we cannot uh, difference uh, between the uh, nodule CCs as the same uh, results. And in another the paper from uh, Dr. Mu, uh, with a, uh, this team was microwave ablation of visible bending thyroid with different internal characteristics. In this uh, research paper, uh, the volume reduction rate in simple solid nodules, in many solid nodules, and in many kistic nodules are different. The best results are in mainly kistic nodules or in mainly solid nodules. And this is a research paper that uh, the comparison between ultrasound guided percutaneous radiofrequence and microwave ablation in benign thyroid nodules. And they researched the symptoms and the cosmetic scores. And in this uh, research, is radiofrequence ablation a little bit more effective? In a, a new research paper uh, this year, 2021, uh, uh, Dr. Guo from China compares the radiofrequence ablation and microwave upon bending trans a systemic review. And in this paper, after 12 months, they compare the volume reduction rate. And in this uh, paper, uh, the volume reduction rate is better compared to uh, microwave, a little bit more. But uh, in the radiofrequence ablation uh, study, the ablation stations are more than one. And if they, in the same research paper, if they 
compare the complications uh, in microwave uh, ablation are the complications a little bit more compared to radio frequency ablation. And what are the nodule features that increase the volume reduction rate and which uh, nodule must we choose to ablation? Uh, the first is the spongiform ecostructure. And the best results are in this group. Nodules with liquid component. Nodules with intense peripheral and internodal pattern vascularity. And in my clinic, we look to uh, share wave elastography. And uh, below 30 kilopascal, this group uh, we choose to ablate. Uh, if the uh, if the patient's thyroid nodule have microcalcifications, and if the shear wave elastography uh, up, uh, above 30 or 40 kilopascals, we don't prefer uh, uh, ablation. And if the nodule volume uh, below 10 cc, uh, the volume reduction rate is better. And there are many technical factors that affect volume reduction rate. The first is the operator skills and experience. In microwave ablation, uh, is, uh, we must choose low watts because if we watch uh, the same watts uh, that we use in radio frequency, 50 or 60 watt, then occur uh, in microwave carbonization. Therefore, we use low watts. And the ablation of the peripheral margins of the thyroid nodule is very important because the mostly the growth point is from there. And this is uh, the, related with the uh, skills and experience of the operator. In these cases, we use hydrodissection because if we use hydrodissection, there are better ablation of the nodule margins. And if we use hydrodissection, uh, protection from complications complications and by preventing thermal damage to the structures such as uh, recurrent lar uh, laryngeal nerve and nervous fibers adjunct to the nodule. And in the most papers from Asia uh, that use microwave ablation, they use uh, hydrodissection. And this is a case uh, that I do today. And uh, she was a 67 year old woman uh, her nodule was 67 cc, a big nodule. And uh, we do before uh, uh, shear wave elastography, and the, it was a soft uh, nodule, 27 kilopascal. And before ablation, we look to the anatomical structures uh, close to the uh, nodule, and we see anatomical variation of nervous vagus. And there was a scientific paper from Dr. Bayek. And his paper, he described the uh, nervous vagus variations here. And he's in the paper, the mostly uh, type of nervous vagus anatomic site is type one and the three o'clock and, uh, and type two. In type three in 10 o'clock and in type four in six o'clock, six o'clock in this uh, types are thermal uh, nerves damage high risk. In your case, it was, was, it was type three here. And we use uh, dextrose uh, to make a hydrodissection and we, the, we have a, 6.7 millimeter safe area. And then uh, we look, it was a mild vascular. And then we uh, give local anesthesia below the thyroid capsule. And here is the hero dissection. And then uh, we begin to ablate from the posterior imperial.
and uh, in after in uh, 30 minutes when we look there was no we covered all the uh, nodule and ablate that is finished thank you uh, for your uh, for Antalya. Uh, thank you dr Chekic, for the excellent lecture uh, we will come back to you at the q a session so um yeah, and our last speaker is Dr. Jose Luis de Pura, and his topic is neck ablations beyond the border. Uh, we have his recording, pre recording here. Uh, I'm going to share it with you. Can you see my screen? Thank you for the invitation to share this webinar uh, around fire regulation. I am Jose Luis del Cura uh, from the Hospital Universitario de Nostia in San Sebastian. And uh, I'm going to address uh, the less uh, frequent uh, indications of uh, neck ablations. Uh, as you see, as you have uh, previously known, uh, we have uh, several guidelines that uh, indicates uh, the current uh, indications and also technique of treatments. Uh, here are a couple of the more known, the Italian one, uh, the train statement and the uh, Korean guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines indicate us uh, which are uh, in the current knowledge uh, the most frequent uh, indications we have for uh, viral ablation. These indications are mainly focused in the uh, treatment of volumetric uh, nodules. Uh, the, the, is focused in the goitier in the treatment of uh, uh, local symptoms or aesthetic problems uh, due to uh, fire nodules. But uh, all of these uh, guidelines included also uh, some indications uh, no, not related with the goitier. That's uh, uh, mainly uh, toxic or pretoxic uh, cell functioning thyroid nodules, and also treatment of malignant conditions uh, based in the thyroid. Uh, so I'm going to address uh, these and frequent indications. I'm, going to, I'm not going to address the, the, the indication, the treatment of the benign, benign thyroid nodules, but I'm going to address uh, in the next minutes the toxic nodules, the cell function in fire nodules, uh, and the problem of the malignant conditions. I'm going to add also another uh, condition that uh, is near the thyroid, but not related to this uh, gland, that is uh, related to the adjacent gland, uh, to the uh, parathyroid gland, that is hyperparathyroidism, in which uh, the treatment and the te technique are uh, quite similar to uh, the technique we use for thyroid. So, uh, now the treatment of the nodules in the net is based on surgery, mainly in the surgery. We have also the radio iodine for treatment in some specific situation, but mainly all of the problems we have to face in the thyroid regarding the toxic nodules, metastasic nodules, and also in hyperparathyroidism are uh, based uh, on surgery, as <clears throat> you know. The problem of surgery is that uh, it's not uh, without cost. Uh, surgery frequently causes uh, uh, complication like uh, uh, hypothyroidism in case that uh, obviously we need to resect the, the thyroid. Also frequently we can uh, damage the parathyroids and uh, we can cause hypoparathyroidism. And also we can uh, have uh, some problems with the uh, structures uh, surrounding the thyroid, especially the recurrent nerve. Um, it's not infrequent that the surgery cause uh, lesion in this nerve and cause hoarseness. Uh, also, uh, radiodine have uh, uh, different, but also have problems. And the main problem is the, the hypothyroidism that uh, can be caused because of the damage of this, the, the radioiodine into the, uh, the, the, the thyroid parenchyma. 
so we have a pill for another techniques and uh, this field can be uh, used by percutaneous techniques well first uh, condition i'm going to treat uh, i'm going to address is the the, the autonomous style nodules the, as i've uh, previously said uh, the current style treatment options are uh, surgery and uh, radiodyne but uh, current guidelines include uh, uh, thermal ablation among the uh, possibilities for this uh, uh, condition uh, but they uh, indicate the thermal ablation with surgery or radiodyne is contraindicated or refused uh, the problem is that uh, about a fifth of the patient develop uh, clinical hyperthyroidism after radiodyne and well, usually uh, most uh, many patients also uh, develop uh, hypothyroidism after surgery so what can we say about the ablation about uh, the possibilities uh, of ablation in this kind of nodules well we have now uh, uh, meta-analysis review, a uh, recent review and meta-analysis of the uh, regarding efficacy and safety of uh, thermal ablation for this kind of uh, conditions. Uh, this uh, uh, systematic review gathered uh, a total of uh, 14 uh, studies with uh, more than 400 patients uh, with autonomous uh, thyroid nodules treated by thermal ablations. Um, uh, they uh, reported that uh, in the primary success was uh, with the TC TSH normalization was achieved in more than 70% of the patients in a mean follow-up for more than a year. Uh, well, the problem with this uh, systematic review is that uh, the quality of the uh, of the evidence uh, of this article was not uh, very very high because many of these cases uh, many, many of these articles were based uh, in small case reports and the selection of participants was not very clear so probably we need another uh, more uh, case series more control for uh, to uh, demonstrate the evidence behind the technique uh, to treat uh, these uh, nodules uh, with uh, ablation. But uh, what can we what we can uh, say for sure with this uh, systematic review is that thermal ablation is effective, and uh, uh, above all, it is very safe in this kind of nodules because uh, restoration of thyroidism is achieved in most of the nodules. And the most important thing is that no significant uh, complication was observed, has been observed in this case series uh, report. Uh, the, the complication was uh, about 2% and all of them were minor. And uh, curiously, one of the conclusions of this uh, systematic review is that efficacy is not uh, related to volume. The, the, the nodal volume is not, uh, was not important to, uh, for the efficacy. And um, so uh, we can treat any kind of uh, nodes. I am uh, to bring here an example of uh, this kind of treatments. This was a patient with hyperthyroidism in which uh, the gamma graphics can demonstrate a couple of nodules uh, in the uh, right lobe of the thyroid. The nodes were demonstrated also in the ultrasound, as you can see here, both of them. And uh, due to the condition of the patients, the, the, the characteristic of the patient we decided, decided to treat them uh, using uh, ablation and this is the, the the treatment the treatment in the uh, in the toxic nodules is absolutely identical similar to the treatment of any kind of uh, benign nodule in the thyroid we uh, also perform it using the, the moving soup technique we can use uh, also uh, radio frequency or microwaves uh, for this kind of, of treatments and uh, usually uh, the difference is that uh, we uh, treat to uh, completely uh, to treat uh, as, as much as possible the nodule to avoid the remaining tissue, that remaining functional tissue uh, at the end of the, the procedure. The technique, as you can see, is absolutely similar. And finally, we cover the, 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 the whole nodule. Uh, we like uh, to perform at the end of the of the ablation procedures a uh, contrast uh, has ultrasound to uh, demonstrate the, the, the potential presence of some areas of untreated uh, um, uh, tissue <coughs> in the uh, area of uh, treatment uh, like in this case we demonstrate no uh, no remaining tissue after the, the treatment 
And well, this is the, the follow up after two years of the treatment. You can see that the, the both nodules have uh, shrinked and <coughs> only <coughs> small scar was observed. The contrast enhances also demonstrated that these scars has no uh, enhancement. So, and the most important thing is that a TSH normalized immediately the, uh, the after the, the procedure, this the procedure was performed here, and you can see that the TCH uh, rises uh, <coughs> skyrocket immediately after the procedure. The patient is uh, perfectly well uh, nowadays. <coughs> Another of the indications included in the guidelines was the treatment of lymph node metastasis after treatment of uh, the carcinoma. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, uh, I have to say that the surgery is not. Uh, completely efficacious uh, in the treatment of uh, five carcinoma because uh, the long-term recurrence rate uh, has been uh, reported to be very high that as high as 30 uh, percent of the of the cases in the in the series uh, well uh, in this case when uh, lymph node metastasis appears uh, is the diagnosis uh, the treated standard treatment uh, up till now is uh, surgeon the problem of uh, surgery is that if you speak with a surgeon, uh, surgeons uh, always say that uh, operating this kind of patient is a nightmare uh, because uh, they, when they open the field, uh, they found the post-operative mm -hmm. tip fibrosis in which uh, finding the, the nodules is very, very difficult. And uh, of course, you can say uh, frequently where the recurrent nerve part uh, mm -hmm. is when the, and the complications are very frequent. So they hate uh, really operating this case of uh, patients. So, they have uh, proposed uh, they have been proposed uh, another alternative like active surveillance especially for smaller uh, nodules and we have uh, another field for percutaneous technique percutaneous uh, injection has been used uh, to treat this kind of, uh, of nodules but the problem of ethanol is that uh, injection uh, the injection of ethanol inside the nodule uh, is difficult to control uh, Especially the extension of the of the ethanol. Uh, frequently, the ethanol is not able to completely uh, cover the the whole nodule, and frequently the ethanol goes beyond the boundaries of the nodule and can uh, act uh, against the the, the recurrent nerve that is very uh, very very close. And uh, the uh, the frequency of complications, especially the, the recurrent nerve lesion, uh, is uh, high. In, uh, and use, we, we use uh, percutaneous ethanol injection. So ablation is, I think, that is a, a more efficacious and uh, safe alternative. Well, regarding this uh, indication, uh, we have uh, already uh, an article that addressing a study addressing the, the efficacy and safety, safety of right frequency ablation compared with uh, surgery. Uh, we have um, a series in which uh, the patients were um, uh, randomized into uh, ablation and repeat uh, surgery. And well, the results of comparing the, 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 the both techniques is uh, that uh, at uh, one and three year, uh, the recurrence free survival rates of uh, both series were similar. So there was no uh, difference in efficacy between surgery and ablation. But uh, and, and also there was no difference also in complications. Surprisingly, that uh, post-operative worseness rate uh, was uh, similar in both cases. The difference was that uh, <clears throat> ablation was uh, uh, superior in avoiding hypocalcemia uh, after uh, after uh, treatment. Surgery was uh, more prone to damage the parathyroid glands to, to, to resect the uh, anaplastic. Uh, without uh, uh, wishing it, the uh, parathyroid uh, during surgery. So, uh, in fact, after this uh, this study, uh, we can say that uh, ablation is a better alternative for this kind of patients that I'm sorry. Well, when we spoke about um, uh, this kind of treatment, uh, especially uh, in patients uh, in which uh, uh, the file was uh, resected. The uh, ablation, uh, I have to, to, to emphasize the uh, importance of a, of a technical gesture like hydro dissection for this kind of treatments. Hydro dissection is absolutely critical because when we perform these uh, treatments, we find uh, usually the nodules uh, absolutely close to uh, potentially damage the structures like uh, nerve, like uh, vessels and like recurrent nerve. So 
uh, is just in a, a needle uh, between uh, around the the, the, the nodule uh, we are going to treat to uh, inject uh, saline in the case of microwaves, the strokes in the case of uh, radio frequency, uh, uh, to uh, separate the nodules with uh, any other potentially damaged uh, structure is mandatory. Uh, ultrasound allow us, as you had, uh, as you can see here, allow us an uh, exquisite uh, um, uh, placement of the needle and uh, a, a very, very uh, uh, <clears throat> effective uh, uh, separation of the uh, nodule from uh, as you said structures i am going to i want to emphasize the importance of uh, hydrodissection in this uh, treatment well i'm going to share with you uh, some uh, cases uh, this is one of them uh, this is a small lip node metastasis that was diagnosed uh, by um, a previous uh, uh, th uh, thyroglobulin uh, uh, sample uh, of the of the novel and well first of all we perform hydrodissection and uh, you can see that we uh, separate first uh, uh, the, the nodule from the deeper structures and then from the um, especially from the bowel nerve and the um, and the vessels and after this we insert it to the, the, the needle, the uh, ablation needle uh, inside and we perform the ablation. This, in this case, we use a microwave. Uh, this is an antenna. So the, the ablation started uh, uh, at the end of the, at the tip of the, of the, of the needle and well, it was beyond and the, at the end of the procedure, we found uh, this. We perform, as I said uh, previously, again, a contrast enhanced ultrasound that demonstrate uh, what we uh, suspected uh, to be a small area of enhancement in the peripheral area of the, of the nodule. And we perform, again, a new ablation of this area, uh, uh, fully uh, ablating uh, the, the nodule. And well, this is another case, smaller one, a small nodule uh, located uh, just close to the, the carotid. And when well, the treatment was similar, we performed, first of all, an, uh, an hydrodissection uh, uh, to separate uh, the, the, the nodule from the uh, deeper structures and then uh, a new a new puncture uh, function allow us to separate it uh, from uh, the recurrent nerve. The, the recurrent nerve is uh, especially the structure uh, to be especially care of when we perform these procedures. A, a big amount of fluid can be used to to separate the node from the from the area close to the trachea. And what the, finally we perform the ablation. You can see here the, the, the procedure. At the end of the procedure, the contrast enhanced ultrasound demonstrated no enhancement in the area treated, and well, the, the, the patient uh, fully recovered. Another uh, final case, uh, small node. All, all of these nodes used to be small usually, so uh, treatment is not uh, is uh, somehow challenging, uh, technically challenging. Uh, and uh, well, we perform the, the hydrodissection. You can see here how perform it is to 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 make a, a, a safe area uh, around the, the nodule. And finally, we perform the ablation like in the other cases. Well, uh, one of the problems of lymph node metastasis is that uh, frequently we have to face not one, but several uh, nodules, uh, like in this case, in which uh, you can see two uh, nodules, two lymph node metastasis in the left side of the, of the neck. Well, uh, in this case, hydrosection, again, is important, but uh, uh, it's important to remember that uh, you have to uh, do to deal with uh, first with the deeper nodules to, to avoid that uh, the bubbles generated after the ablation uh, make it uh, difficult to uh, treat uh, the more superficial uh, nodules. Well, in this case, first we perform hydrodissection again uh, in the uh, deeper node, and after this we inserted the the, the mic the antenna uh, and perform microwave ablation of the nodule, and after treatment. Uh, the, 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 the deeper uh, nodule, we deal with it with a, with a more superficial cell. One, uh, we perform again a hydrodissection, and finally, we insert the antenna and perform the ablation. At the end of the procedure, both nodules have no enhancement, and well, the, the result has been very, very, very good for these nodules. <clears throat> well, outside of the 
outside of the fiber, we can find uh, another potential field of uh, application for uh, ablation that is uh, primary hyperparty. This uh, this condition is not frequent, but uh, also is not rare. Uh, it uh, uh, about the incidence is about uh, 0.482 cases in the different series uh, every hundred thousand uh, people. Uh, also, I have to say that um, in many cases, uh, the hyperparathyroidism is not uh, symptomatic and clinically is relevant. In this case, uh, treatment is not necessary. But uh, in symptomatic patients, uh, usually uh, treat, uh, treating uh, uh, parathyroid surgery is uh, recommended. The problem is that uh, in some cases, uh, uh, surgery is not uh, suitable for this patient or some others decline surgery. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, uh, the, the surgery for primary hyperparathyroidism is not without cost. The recurrent nerve injury is frequent and uh, it's not rare also that uh, the patient uh, had at the end of the, the, of the, uh, of the surgery a uh, persistent hyperparathyroidism. Uh, so uh, this opens a field for the alternatives. I have uh, spoken about the, the percutaneous external injection. Uh, it has the, the same process that I have explained previously uh, regarding lip node metastasis. And also, we have field for uh, percutaneous ablation. Uh, what about per percutaneous ablation? Well, we have a, a several, we have a, a recent uh, review of analysis of the articles uh, that have been published about this. Uh, most of articles near 200. <coughs> have been a uh, small uh, case reports, uh, and uh, in this uh, systematic review, they only uh, included five uh, art, five studies in which the, the, the strict uh, inclusive criteria were met. Uh, the total of patients were 84. Well, the, the, the result in these uh, studies was that uh, the <clears throat> at six months after the ablation, the PTH and post ablative and, and calcium level uh, after the ablation was uh, was uh, in most of the articles uh, normal. So uh, <clears throat> this treatment was uh, successful in uh, uh, in solving the problem, the, the clinical problem of the patient, especially the the, the levels of the of the uh, PTH and. <clears throat> But the problem was that uh, this treatment was uh, not without complication. In fact, complications were uh, frequent, has been frequent in the uh, high, in, uh, the treatment of, uh, of in parathyroid ablation. The ratio of uh, dysphonia after the, the procedure was near, <coughs> uh, was higher than 20%. Uh, it is true that uh, in the <coughs> Reported cases, the uh, dysphonia was transient uh, because it disappeared uh, within one month. But uh, the level of uh, the, the the ratio of, uh, of uh, frequency of uh, this complication is uh, is relatively high. It's, you have to keep it uh, in mind when uh, performing this kind of uh, procedures. The other complications were minor, but not important. <clears throat> This is a, a case, an example of treatment of uh, parathyroid uh, adenoma. Um, well, this is a patient with uh, symptomatic hyper hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the levels of uh, of uh, PTH was uh, very high, and uh, well, uh, we performed uh, him a gammagraphic scan that demonstrated a, a small uh, hot nodule uh, that was located just uh, in the upper part of the mediastinum. Uh, this uh, hot nodule was uh, demonstrated in the uh, CT to uh, correspond to a nodule with an excel calcification just in, in the in the thoracic hiatus in the, in the upper part of the mediastinum. Uh, the location was, uh, as you see, very challenging for surgeons. Surgeons refused to perform surgery in this case, so we decided to uh, treat it, uh, to, to see if uh, we can treat it uh, with ablation. Uh, we performed an ultrasound that demonstrated that the nodule could be perfectly seen uh, in a very challenging location, but perfectly seen uh, just close to the to the carotid uh, artery in the in the neck, and we performed the, the procedure. First of all, again, I um, I want to stress it: uh, we perform hydrodissection. It is in the parathyroid gland is absolutely uh, critical and mandatory, and we perform with inserted uh, <clears throat> following two paths: a uh, needle behind the the 
pool to separate it especially from the from the trachea to avoid the the, the damage of the recurrent nerve and also from the uh, vessels uh, to avoid uh, the damage of them and also from the of the valve nerve and finally we uh, proceed to the treatment uh, we inserted the middle uh, the, the Micro and then inside and uh, perform the the uh, ablation of the of the node immediately after the ablation, as you can see in this curve, the ablation was performed here. The levels of PTH normalized completely, so uh, the patient, uh, the patient, as well the patient disappeared completely. <clears throat> uh, last uh, comment regarding uh, another indication, more controversial. I left uh, it uh, for the end because it's the most controversial indication that uh, is the ablation of papillary microgas by carcinomas. Uh, the, uh, this means carcinomas below one centimeter in, the, in diameter. This is a controversial indication. Why? Uh, well, uh, first of all, the guidelines usually uh, do not recommend it. Uh, the, the, why? The, because uh, they have the problem with chronic carcinomas uh, when you uh, resect the uh, <clears throat> thyroid because of uh, papillary carcinoma is not rare that uh, is rare it's not frequent but it's not exceptional that the patient has another carcinoma in another part of the thyroid but also the, we have a problem that uh, during uh, surgery uh, frequently nodal uh, <clears throat> Uh, leaf node uh, chains are uh, partially resected uh, so to avoid uh, the nodal metastasis in the ablation. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, treatment cannot be uh, done. And also we have the problem of the, the, the control of the result because uh, after the ablation we create an area of uh, scar that is difficult to distinguish from the from a, a, a remain a recurrent cancer so uh, up till now uh, only small say have, have been published that is a developing uh, developing field uh, recently uh, we have uh, had we have seen the publication of uh, the most the biggest uh, series regarding this uh, technique uh, has been published uh, just uh, some months ago. Uh, in, uh, in this series, the authors included more than 400 patients uh, with the mean follow up, uh, well, uh, not short, sure, uh, more than four years. Uh, the authors report that no significant uh, complication uh, occurred in, uh, his, uh, in their treatments and uh, Near 900 of the of the tumors completely disappeared. The dark side of the of the <clears throat> of this <clears throat> series is that uh, there was uh, local tumor progression in 50 patients, about uh, near four four percent of uh, of the patients. Uh, but uh, it is true that uh, all uh, these patients, uh, all these uh, recurrences, uh, all these uh, pro uh, local uh, progression were treated, and all but three uh, were uh, successful. But well, uh, there was uh, three of the patients that uh, couldn't be treated with this technique. So it's true that uh, surgery remains as an alternative in this case, because ablation uh, do not avoid uh, the, the possibility of surgery. Uh, it's true that. Uh, the follow-up of uh, this patient was relatively short. Uh, four years appears as, as a long time, but in fact, uh, five, uh, papillary carcinoma is, uh, is a carcinoma that uh, is indolent, so it can develop uh, over a long time. And also that uh, the authors could uh, completely exclude central metastasic lymph nodes and multifocality in other parts of the eye. So, in conclusion, uh, you can see that ablation is very effective in uh, toxic nodules because uh, it uh, achieves uh, normalization of TCH in most patients without uh, significant risk. Also, we can say the same regarding uh, primary hyperparatidism and uh, levels of uh, PTH. Uh, well, uh, the outcome for ablation in uh, lymph node metastasis of thyroid carcinoma is, as you, as we have seen, similar to surgery, but with less secondary effects. So this is an indication that I think that all of these indications that uh, will go uh, uh, more uh, more uh, frequent in the in the next year. And also, uh, ablation is an alternative to surgery in papillary microcarcinoma when surgery is not suitable, but uh, a 
now probably is not uh, the, the choice uh, treatment cannot be considered the choice treatment. And more important, it's important that the experience, uh, the, 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 these uh, techniques and these treatment are challenging, so experience is uh, required. And also probably we need more research to see which is uh, the real role of this uh, kind of uh, treatments in this uh, not so frequent indication of uh, thyroid ovulation. Uh, we have seen that uh, thyroid ovulation has become my experience. Uh, uh, now uh, the most uh, frequent uh, treatment than uh, any other kind of, uh, of treatments uh, we perform, uh, the ablative treatment we perform in, in other organs like uh, uh, liver, kidney, and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, this uh, these uh, alternative treatments uh, will also increase uh, with the time, probably uh, will make uh, metabolization more and more frequent in the next years. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was the wonderful lecture from Dr. Jose Luis de Cura. And now we are uh, going into the Q&A session. So we, we, we got a couple of questions in, in the comment session. So uh, can I invite our uh, speakers today to uh, click the um, video and audio, uh, the audio, your mic at the same time. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we have a question for Dr. Mori. Um, what do you prefer, microwave ablation or RFA, according to your experience? Dr. Mori, are you here? Yes, yes, I'm here. And can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. And so uh, thanks again for this invitation. And thank you for this, uh, this question that is very, uh, I think, uh, very interesting. So actually, uh, my personal opinion is that the most important thing is the experience of the of the operator. I started with laser, then used radio frequency. Now I'm using microwaves too. Uh, but probably in the most uh, uh, standard uh, uh, way, the, the benign thyroid nodule, the simple thyroid nodule, probably all the techniques, if applied uh, correctly, can achieve good, uh, good results. In the benign standard thyroid nodule, probably uh, microwaves can be a little bit faster in achieving uh, the nodule destruction. And uh, uh, probably my feeling is that uh, it's a little bit also faster in achieving nodule reduction, uh, nodule volume reduction. It means that at the three months, it seems to be a little bit uh, faster, the reduction. Then at one year, probably the results are exactly the same. Uh, in uh, where I do not uh, still I consider uh, microwaves is, for example, for lymph nodes or for parathyroid that are a little bit small. And I think the higher power of microwaves still scare me uh, a little bit, but probably it's only a matter of um, of experience. Uh, on the other hand, where I think probably I would choose microwaves instead of radio frequency is, for example, for hypervascular nodule or hyperfunctioning nodules, where the, the higher power and the less and the, um, being less affected by the heat sink effect from the high uh, vascularization can probably improve the, the results. So at the moment, probably the hyperfunctioning nodules are the one that I prefer for, uh, for the uh, use of microwaves. I hope to have uh, answered to the, the questions. And probably we can also have the, the opinion of other uh, speakers on this point where they choose to have to use microwaves instead of radio frequency. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, what do you think, Dr. Cekic? Uh, I say the same things with uh, what say Dr. Mauri. It's dependent on the experience, uh, what you use. Uh, I use microwave in uh, toxic adenomas, in hypervascular nodules. 
and sometimes uh, in uh, colloidal big nodules because in colloidal big nodules if the viscosity high uh, sometimes radiofrequency ablation is not uh, enough then i use microwave this is with experience uh, i think so this is what i say okay thank you very much uh, dr dakura are you here yes i am Perfect. well okay. uh, now we are using uh, mainly microwave uh, because uh, we have observed that uh, it's more uh, efficient and um, uh, more effective in the treatment of the of the of the nodules is uh, a big fa a bit faster and uh, in fact it allows us uh, to perform a speci specific technique we use uh, of a, a, a continuous shot that uh, allow us to perform the ablation in a faster way so for us uh, is more convenient Say this. I have to say that in uh, in my we, we, I work in a private uh, and also in a public uh, 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 environment in in the different hospitals and in the public hospital I perform the procedures using a radio frequency because of the cost and the, our uh, public hospital uh, is very 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 strict with this uh, policy. So uh, I differentiate uh, the, the, this. Uh, uh, these environments, but usually I prefer using microwave because of the of the of the better results. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we have another question: um, What is the limit in terms of volume to treat securely AFTN? Do, do you do you understand the, the question? Because um because I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you want me to start answering this? Yes, please. It's, okay. We, okay. Do, are we using the, the same order as presentation for answering the question, if, you, if you're okay? It doesn't have to be like that, but you, no. <laughs> please go ahead. So actually, uh, I do not think there is a, a real uh, limit, I say. Uh, we can treat very small one uh, being uh, very careful and with excellent results. Uh, of course, we can also treat very large one, but at that point, the, um, the limit is not the technique, but the indication, because we know that in very large nodules, uh, the results can be uh, very good in uh, terms of volume reduction and in achieving uh, uh, results on symptoms on compression, but uh, it is very more difficult to, to achieve results in terms of, of function. So generally, I tend to select uh, uh, quite a small nodule as ideal candidate for thermal ablation and uh, uh, only if it is not possible to have surgery or radioiodine to go for ablation of uh, of large nodules, which is your your experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, in my clinic, uh, the most the patients they come to. Uh, I work in a state hospital. Uh, they have high cosmetic uh, scores, example four or three. And if the patients have high uh, cosmetic scores, the nodule is big nodules, four centimeters or the five centimeters. And the mostly is young women. They don't have uh, thyroid surgery because they want a scar or uh, they want to prevent their uh, thyroid gland. And therefore, uh, in my hospital, uh, the most uh, the patients' the volumes are high because uh, the surgery sent this uh, group of patients to us. Uh, the young young woman, the most uh, patients are young women. They want to prevent the thyroid gland and they have cosmetic uh, uh, problems, big, and there are uh, big nodules mostly. And another uh, term is why must I ablate a small nodule? if they are not hyperfunction, or if they are not a toxic adenoma. Example, it is a 15 millimeter or 20 millimeter nodule. If they have any symptoms, uh, we don't ablate it. That's my, what I say. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I think the question was, uh, was on uh, hyperfunctioning thyroid nodules. Ah, okay. So, so oh, the, the matter here is, is uh, how do you choose hyperfunctioning uh, 
target nodule in in size. I mean, oh. uh, I, I totally agree yeah, that the largest one. I suppose one that this was the, the question. Yeah. yeah. Also. yeah. Well, I, um, really, the, the the size in this specific case only in this specific case size doesn't matter. In fact, I think that uh, size is not important. I think that uh, you can treat. Uh, 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 obviously, the, the the bigger the nodule, uh, the most uh, uh, the, the most challenging it, it is, especially if the nodule is located in a in a dangerous area. But uh, only only this, uh, I think, that uh, treatment of the nodules depend on the you, you uh, probably needs in this case, especially in toxic nodules, you need to be sure that you are treating the, the most uh, completely the nodule. Uh, besides this, I think that uh, size is not important, only in this case. And do you have uh, good results also on normalization of the function also in, in, in large nodules? Because what I saw is that sometimes we can achieve complete normalization in, in a smaller yeah. one, while in large one is more difficult. Uh, probably because it's uh, the, 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 the biggest, the most difficult to, to completely treat. But in fact, uh, I usually uh, most of uh, most of toxic nodules are not very, very big. Uh, uh, but uh, despite of this, I think that uh, we have uh, performed treatment of some nodules that are uh, the, uh, of similar size of the uh, usual hyperplastic nodules uh, and uh, the results uh, have been good and we have we have not had uh, complications significant complications up till now uh, we have a research paper about this theme last year we have published it and we treated 30 toxic adenomas and we compare it with radioactive iot therapy but the success was was uh, only 60 percent with uh, microwave uh, because uh, about the three centimeters, uh, the success was, was more lower uh, under uh, three centimeters. So the success was uh, uh, lower better, and better, 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 better for better, a small one. Yeah, smaller than three centimeters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my experience, my experience too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but you, I suppose that you get a, a, a near normalization of the of the, anal uh, the analytics, no? Yeah, the we have a sixty percent. Sixty in sixty percent of the uh, patients was normal the, the TCH, the biochemical parameters, and not in the rest. What? Not in the rest. Uh, okay. I, I think in this field uh, we, we still need some uh, some more experience and more uh, and more research uh, because also are less frequent than uh, uh, non-functioning nodules. So probably we will have a better answer in the near future, hopefully. Yeah, they... uh, we have we have also another problem is that you can treat a nodule, but maybe you have another toxic nodule. Sometimes uh, toxic nodules are not. Uh, only one or several. In, in fact, we have seen this uh, not uh, not infrequently. Maybe. Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, shall we move on? Yes. Do you have another question? Yes, we do have a lot of questions. Okay. The third question is. Um, uh, what is the power that used for microwave ablation uh, normally uh, and uh, how to avoid vagus nerve injury or recurrent, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury? Okay, uh, I start again. Uh, I generally use uh, uh, 20 to 30 watts generally, and uh, but uh, you can... Uh, choose uh, according to your to the to, to your practice the most important thing is to avoid the danger area and to perform eventually a careful hydro dissection uh, that is the same uh, i think for uh, every kind of ablative technique thank you um i think it's pretty much the same with uh... yes yeah <laughs> okay yeah. <laughs> Okay. I have a question to Dr. Jose. Jose. 
uh, if I uh, use hydrodissection, I use saline or dextrose uh, in big nodules. Uh, the in the very small time, it, uh, the hydrodissection, the fluid was absorbed absorption, and the safe area uh, was uh, low. What do you do? Uh, do you uh, give more uh, fluid for hydrodissection in this, or uh, do you use continuous hydrodissection? No, no, I use uh, I, I don't use continuous hydrodissection because in this area usually uh, you are going to perform very very fast procedures, and uh, in fact, uh, in most of the uh, the uh, in most of the times I try to to perform uh, as big <laughs> as big as uh, as possible in hydro, uh, the hydrosection. So it's I think this, it's important to to separate the the, uh, the areas to treat uh, in case from the not the danger areas from the tracheans uh, because the recurrent nerve can be can be there and also from the bowel nerve the bowel nerve is important but the bowel nerve can be controlled because you can see it uh, very very uh, perfectly well so it's not a problem the problem is uh, the recurrent nerve as i used to say uh, i for most the 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 animals I can see that the animals can, the, the danger can that, that can see so it's, it's important. So I think that uh, in uh, the case of uh, nodules of lymph nodes metastasis and in the case of parathyroid uh, uh, adenomas, in these cases hydrodissection is uh, you uh, never you are not going to perform a, a, a small hydrodissection never. Uh, you 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 can try to perform uh, as uh, as uh, to, to inject as, uh, as amount of uh, fluid as possible to separate uh, safely uh, of, uh, from the dangerous areas. Yes. There is, there is another question about, uh, I think that it's for me, about follow-up of parathyroid lesions. Uh, and, um, and yes, I have to say that uh, we, uh, we, form, uh, we are part of a multidisciplinary uh, committee that uh, follow-ups the, 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 the nodules after treatment. And in the case of, uh, of uh, parathyroid lesions, um, uh, in fact, we are not a shrinkage. Shrinkage cage, uh, is not important. I think that uh, usually, frequently, we don't uh, observe a shrinkage of uh, these nodules or significant shrinkage. But uh, the most important thing is the, is the is the clinic the, the the not especially the normalization of uh, of uh, PTH levels, but especially the the, the, the clinics. Uh, in fact, sometimes you have uh, patients with uh, high levels of PTH and without clinics. In these cases, you you don't need to treat them. Uh, but uh, if you normalize the PTH, uh, you can be sure that uh, the, the patient is going to to become uh, subclinic or or without uh, symptoms. So this is our main goal. So this is the I think that the 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 key uh, uh, the, the most important uh, uh, feature in the follow up, not uh, the, the the change in size or the change in shape of uh, the nodules we treat in this case. Yes, if I may comment on this, I totally agree. And also, we always work together with uh, endocrinologists uh, who uh, with the selection of cases is performed uh, together. And also, the follow up uh, is uh, by us uh, performing ultrasound, but uh, particularly by endocrinologists who will have to follow the patient. And I think multidisciplinarity is crucial for application of thermal ablation. Uh, particularly for uh, uh, parathyroid, but also for lymph nodes or uh, carcinomas. Uh, we cannot avoid to have a multidisciplinary approach to this patient. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a lot more questions in the comment session, so we're moving on. Um, is there any comparison of applicability between radio frequency and microwave ablation. Um, I mean, I think the meaning is, is there any difference between the application of microwave ablation and radio frequency ablation? Dr. Cekic, could you please tell us your experience? I have not so much experience in pyrotrite ablation. Maybe the question is better for Dr. Jose Yulis. 
-hmm. Well, I said before that uh, uh, we, we have changed from uh, radio frequency to, to uh, microwave because we have observed a, a, not only a, not only a faster procedure that is not a, the most important thing, but also a, a, a improvement in a terms of a decrease of volume uh, after treatment. So uh, we are now performing more and more the the. Uh, my, uh, the, the treatment with microwave. So microwave allow us to uh, target specifically the areas of higher vascularization inside the nodules. That is uh, for us is important. Radio frequency uh, uh, is not useful for this because, uh, in fact, the heat sink effect uh, uh, allow, uh, avoids uh, the is uh, makes this uh, this targeting uh, less effective. And in the case of microwave, I think that uh, it allows us to obtain better results in my experience, but well. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, there is another question. Is there a thyroid crisis risk in toxic nodules? Dr. Mori? Yes, in, in theory, this, this is possible. I never had uh, this kind of, uh, of problem. Uh, my, uh, my idea is that probably we are also in some way destroying, uh, together with the tissue that we are destroying, also the, the, the hormones in, um, in some way. So uh, actually, I never had any hyper uh, crisis after, uh, immediately after ablation, with, with, regardless of the technique. I don't know the experience of others. No. no. Me too. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, next question. Uh, it's from Ukraine. Okay. Is there a possibility of using LITT for the treatment of malignant thyroid tumors? What are the features? Uh, yes, I think they mean laser ablation. Uh, if, if that's correct, yes, it is possible also to use a uh, uh, laser for ablation of uh, malignant tumors, uh, both for primary microcarcinomas and uh, nodal metastasis. This has been, uh, has been reported uh, with, uh, with good results too. Okay, um, do you have any experience, Dr. Cekic? No, I have actually. Uh, uh, let's move on then. So is your system of biochemical follow-up of parathyroid lesions after RF procedure multidisciplinary? Are you just observing shrinkage? I'm asking as an endocrinologist. I think this question is for Dr. Dakura. Yeah, in fact, uh, the follow-up is performed by by endocrinologists in my case. Uh, so, of course, we for uh, we are part of a of a team in which uh, every uh, every specialist has uh, his uh, its uh, the, the role. So, in this case, um, endocrinologists are the uh, in charge of the of, of following up. We perform uh, also uh, image follow up, but uh, in my experience, image follow up is not the the the, the import uh, the the important feature of the for the follow up. The important uh, uh, fact is the the and of course the the levels of PTH. Okay. Um, do, do, do you have any experience on this, Dr. Mari? Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, again, uh, it is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, endocrinologists are, uh, are crucial in the patient selection, and we have to discuss with our colleague, and we have to work uh, as, uh, as a team. I mean, I am the one with the uh, technical experience because doing ablation of several other organs, they have more uh, experience in the clinical management of those kind of patients. So uh, we, we cannot work work one without the other. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, here's one question for Dr. Cekic. Uh, what liquid do you use for hydrodissection? Uh, in big nodules, uh, uh, if the nodule CC is above 30 or 40 CC, uh, I say before that uh, the absorbed the fluid that we use, Normally we use crystalloid fluids, uh, example dextrose or saline. 
but we have a, a new study. We uh, use colloidal fluids. Example, volubile. Uh, normally, uh, volubile used uh, in the emergency department for hypovolemic shocks because it's the molecular weight is high. And uh, we use only 20 cc uh, volubile for hydrodissection. Uh, example between carotid artery and the nodule. And the duration of the hydrodissection area is 40 minutes. Uh, and it's, it's very practical. We have uh, tried in uh, 40, 60 cases. And this is a, we write it for a research paper. Yeah, that, that's very interesting, uh, I think, because the reabsorption of fluid is uh, often uh, a problem, particularly if we are treating microcarcinomas, we, where we want really to have a large ablation area covering the whole tumor, and we yeah. want to be safe. And that's a very good idea. I'll try that. So it's volume that you are using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, waiting for your paper. <laughs> okay. Um, just a follow-up question. Would you recommend adding steroids to the hydrodissection fluid? Uh, well, not, but uh, in, uh, before uh, we make a mixture of uh, one, one, six or one, five uh, between local anesthetic and uh, dextrose. But in these cases, if we use a mixture, uh, the uh, mostly case have voice changes. Then we don't can't it separate from the uh, if the voice change uh, occur from the ablation or if the voice change occur from the local anesthesia. Therefore, we only use in hydrodissection, uh, dextrose or saline, not uh, a mixture of local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I never, I don't uh, try cort uh, cort uh, corticosteroid, but in a paper from uh, Dr. Bayek from Korea, uh, he uh, write that in uh, if the patient have uh, at the ablation uh, voice changes, uh, or if uh, the patient have Horner syndrome, if you are, uh, see it. You can make a, a mixture with uh, cold saline and uh, corticosteroid, and you can uh, inject it on to the uh, dangerous zone or uh, close to the nervous vagus. Maybe in this cases, you can use corticosteroids. Thank you. Yes, I, I have no experience. I never used uh, steroids. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Delcura, what's your experience? I, yes. I can see the rationale to adding uh, 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 corticosteroids in this case. I perform a lot, uh, a, a lot of procedures in the musculoskeletal system. I use a lot of steroids uh, in these cases. And uh, in fact, I treat uh, uh, frequently uh, entrapments of nerves uh, with corticosteroids. I can understand that uh, corticosteroids can be used for, to, to treat uh, uh, a nerve injury in this case, where once the nerve has been produced, they're not sure about the results in the in this case of uh, of damage by heat, but uh, not uh, uh, I I can understand why is uh, why to 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 inject the corticosteroids in the field uh, for hydrosection. I think that is not. Uh, um, is not necessary hydrosection. In fact, uh, what uh, treats is, is to, to separate the, the, the treated area from the dangerous uh, uh, structure. So corticosteroids adds, I think, nothing. Yeah, I, I agree. Eventually, uh, in case of, of injury, probably I, I can think about this, but I actually I never used. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. What is the uh, corticosteroid protocol for the transient post-ablation nerve injury? Mm. Mm. I sent to the clinic <laughs> normally. Yeah, we, yeah, and it's not my job. Uh, I make a consultation to the air note. Uh, but normally, uh, what I say on the what they give to the medicament is eight milligram cort cortisone. But it's not my job; it's the job of the clinician. Okay. 
Okay. We're, we're radiologists. Uh, it's uh, when uh, <laughs> somebody uh, requests a, a, a doctor in a, in, in an airplane because some, somebody is sick, is, sick uh, uh, is supposed not to request a radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes, I, I agree. I always uh, consult with endocrinologists and uh, luckily uh, had probably just, uh, I remember just one uh, damage that uh, dured uh, more than, uh, let's say, a couple of hours. So, and the patient had problems the day after. So, uh, yes, in that case, we started with eight milligrams uh, for one week uh, and then look how the patient is, is going, is proceeding. And, uh, and, and then the patient recovered after a couple of days. So we didn't have to, to go on with the corticosteroids. But, uh, of course, again, uh, case by case, we have to discuss also with clinicians how to manage with, uh, with, uh, with, those, uh, with those patients. Um, another question. We found that radiofrequency ablation was more effective than microwave ablation in nodule volume reduction in subs substernal goiter. May I know your experiences? I, I have no direct comparison for, for that. I have no experience yeah. comparing those two, those two treatments in yes. that particular group. Dr. Dakura? No. no, no, also. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can compare. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions for each other? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I, can, I can ask to, to Dr. Darkura that I, I think he is uh, using a lot of microwaves uh, while he was using radio frequency um, uh, before. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it, is, it is faster. But uh, have you, are you any, uh, in any case scared about, for example, the shape of ablation, which I found sometimes with microwaves is a little bit more, uh, let's say, uh, oval and, uh, and elongated. So uh, I, I mean, uh, sometimes still I feel a little bit more comfortable with radio frequency, but probably is still a matter of, of experience. Uh, what do you think? There's any case where you still uh, think I would go with radio frequency because I feel a little bit uh, more confident or not? Well, I have to say that I am a bit uh, heterodox, uh, heterodoxical uh, regarding the, the treatment. I use uh, not exactly a moving shot, but a continuous moving shot. So I turn on the, the power and I uh, move the the tip of the needle uh, covering the whole uh, while I'm uh, continuously uh, performing ablation, I move continuously throughout every slice of the of the of the nodule uh, to cover completely it. Uh, when I use microwave, because microwave, uh, you see, radio frequency and microwave are completely different. Radio frequency uh, is uh, uh, works uh, using an electric field. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, there is uh, the, 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 the volume of ablation is limited by the uh, tr transmission of the electric current. But, oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, microwave is completely different. A microwave uh, performs an ablation that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 transmit uh, by uh, direct, uh, direct um, uh, thermal uh, direct damage because of the microwaves. And this um, uh, direct damage is uh, performed at about one centimeter around the, the needle. So if you move the needle, uh, if you compress uh, co uh, uh, press, uh, the, the, the tissue around the, the, the needle, you are uh, performing a bigger volume of ablation. Why? Because uh, the uh, nodule, uh, the tissue of the nodule is uh, soft. So you can press and make it uh, more dense in some parts. So uh, if you uh, move the, 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 the like uh, use the, 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 the needle like a lever, uh, uh, pressing the tissue, uh, probably you uh, achieve a volume of ablation bigger uh, because of the volume of the of the, the area ablated is uh, is made of uh, compressed uh, uh, tissue. So I perform a continuous movement, pressing up and down the, 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 the tissue in the nodule 
to uh, achieve a faster, a very, very faster ablation and very, very effective. In fact, uh, so at the end of the day, uh, I obtained a complete ablation of the nodule in every slice. So I moved uh, from one slice to other to cover completely the, the whole nodule. So I, I, I understand that it's difficult to explain, but uh, in fact, it's, I, 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 I am not sure if I, I, me, I make me yeah. un, uh, understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understood. And so in this way, also, you do not have to, to withdraw uh, the needle. Uh, and so the, 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 most, the more oval shape uh, uh, doesn't scare you about the damage of the skin or, or so on. That's, that's very interesting. I think it's a different, slightly different technique that, that, that should be improved. Yeah. Is is there any other question? I, we we cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. I was asking for Dr. Chekic for his comments on this question. Uh, I use uh, mostly microwave. Uh, it's with experience, uh, uh, as you see in the PowerPoint, I uh, share a case that I do today. It was 63 cc. In 13, 14 minutes, it's over. If you use microwave, the advantage is it is uh, not uh, the uh, structure of the nodule don't affect uh, the uh, ablation uh, success. The nodule can be kistic. Sometimes the kistic viscosity can be higher or it can be hypervascular in microwave. It is not a problem. You can do it, everything. But uh, it, it's a good energy, but uh, um, maybe it can sometimes danger. Therefore, uh, I... Uh, prefer to uh, every, uh, my college, uh, for the new beginners to make a good hydro dissection. Uh, if we make a good hydro, I do hydro dissection in every case because uh, I, I won't give an example with nervous vagus. Sometimes uh, if you, uh, the nervous vagus you say on the uh, example in one o'clock, but uh, by the ablation, if the nodule was shrinkage, uh, the position changes. Therefore, uh, thermal ablation is a new technique, and we must uh, make uh, less failures, uh, minor complications. And to avoid from minor complications, I use uh, in every cases hydro dissection and uh, hydro dissection help to uh, ablate the peripheric margins of the uh, nodule because the mostly regrow points is uh, this uh, portions. And in the beginning of thermal ablation, I use my first uh, cases where I use uh, most technique, not moving shot, uh, uh, fix, fixation technique and fix technique. In the most technique, you cannot ablate all the nodule. Uh, you must use moving shot. It's with the year, with the experience. This is what I say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we it's um, about to be three. Like okay, it, I, it's about to two hours uh, since the webinar started, but we have a couple more questions. Uh, do you prefer going on or we should uh, take the questions after the session is over? Yeah, I, actually, I, 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 I need to go <laughs> at, 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 at 8 p.m. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. No, we, we, we are grateful that you can join us here today. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm just going on. Uh, Dr. Jekic, do you have a couple more minutes to Yeah, yeah, I have minutes, yeah. Perfect, Dr. Dakura? Yeah, yeah. yeah. perfect, perfect, okay. Um, so uh, one question is that a lot of parathyroid adenomas are partly visualized with ultrasound. How to control uh, the ablation of adenoma completed? 
PTH level falls only in 15 minutes. Yeah, this is this is for me, I suppose. Uh, well, uh, uh, <laughs> we don't we don't uh, uh, check the levels of uh, PTH in uh, uh, during the procedures. Uh, we are we are not able. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but uh, in fact, what we do is uh, using uh, image to to see uh, if we cover completely the the abrasion. In fact, we perform at the end of the procedure, you, we perform a contrast enhanced ultrasound, uh, but uh, some ca in some cases, uh, 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 parathyroid, uh, uh, parathyroid adenomas uh, do not enhance, so in these cases, uh, this is not useful, but in, the, in most of the cases, uh, parathyroid adenomas enhance, so if the enhancement disappears at the end of the procedure, you can be pretty sure that the, you have uh, completely treated the, the tumor. Okay, um, thank you very much. Dr. Murray, do you have any experience on this? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we, we treated uh, qu quite a number of, of parathyroid. Of course, it is very important to select properly the patient before, because sometimes you have a patient with hyperparathyroidism where you cannot find precisely the, the adenoma. So in that case, it is, I think it is important to have a preoperative evaluation very careful uh, evaluation. Uh, and that's the a key point of success. Otherwise, you can uh, ablate a nodule and, uh, and the following having no uh, result because the real hyperfunctioning one was, uh, was another one that you were not uh, seeing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose Dr. Mori is leaving. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to go. But thank you very much again for the invitation and thank you all and congratulations for the webinar. So bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. A pleasure to him. Okay. We're, uh, we're going on with the uh, last couple of questions. Okay. So um, do you use the probes that works with a cool system or not? I think I can answer this question for you. You do, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. We don't, we, we don't know any other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And okay, moving on to the next question. When do you use the overlap technique instead of moving shot? Dr. Cekic, can you please uh, take this? Yeah, in, in some uh, kistic cases, uh, you must wait uh, the hyperechoic areas. In these cases, I uh, used the overlapping technique. I, uh, I fixed the uh, antenna and I'm wait to see the hyper echoic area and then I moving sometimes it is a same technique only in this cases in the other cases I use the moving shot technique or if in uh, small toxic adenomas or in parathyroid adenomas small uh, is very small we uh, go in and waiting to cover the hyper echoic area Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Dekura, Your experience? Well, I use a uh, uh, moving shot in case of uh, radio frequency, and the the technique I've tried to explain um, with this, with certain difficulties in the microwave, a continuous uh, a continuous shot, uh, a, a moving shot, but uh, continuous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one last question. Have you ever experienced problems with uh, bleeding when treating mixed nodules with microwave ablation? Yeah. In uh, research papers, they say uh, that we must make a pressure external, but I uh, continue the ablation. I go to the uh, kistic wall and I uh, try to make a coagulation to the blood. Uh, and in these cases, I make the watt higher. Example, normally I use 30 watt, but in these cases, I make the watt uh, 40 or 50 and continue the procedure. And it's then in uh, 10 uh, seconds or in 50 seconds, I control it. Okay, okay. thank you. Dr. Delcora, your experience? I had a, a problem uh, sometime, uh, once uh, in a case uh, of a nodule that had a cystic component uh, uh, close to the recurrent nerve in which the treatment of the nodule 
uh, at the end of the procedure, we had the damage of the of the recurrent nerve of the horses. Uh, I we suppose that uh, probably the the cystic part of the nodule uh, hit the uh, uh, hit the load uh, a lot, so damage uh, transmitted very very well the the, the heat uh, damaging the nerve. So now. We always, in these cases, we previously uh, empty the, 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 the cystic component before treating the, the nodule. Okay, okay, that's, that's very nice. Um, thank you. So uh, that is all the questions for now. And uh, this has been an excellent session. We, we really appreciate your support and your, uh, your, the excellent lectures that you've delivered today. Thank you very much, Dr. Cekic. Thank you very much, Dr. Dakura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope to cooperate with you in future webinars. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye. Of course. Okay. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Bye. Um, okay, bye. 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 Uh, for the audience who hasn't left the uh, Zoom meeting yet, uh, if you want the participation certificate, please email us to the info email address. And if you have more questions, you can also uh, email your questions to us to get the answer. And um, make sure that you're subscribed to Echo Microwave uh, LinkedIn account to get the up-to-date information about future webinars. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, that's it. Bye.